Hi guys, I'm not here in class today, but we're going to have a lecture anyway on significant figures and unit conversions. And just to let you know, um, when I downloaded this uh, PowerPoint into my um, podcast software, it kind of screwed up some of the slides. So you'll see that some of the things are um, a little off, uh, but that's okay. In your notes, they should be uh, perfectly fine. So um, I just wanted to apologize for that at the very beginning. All right, so let's talk about sig figs and unit conversions. And we're going to start out talking about sig figs by taking a look at global warming. So here is um, one of the latest statistics that the average global temperatures um, across the globe have risen by 0.6 degrees Celsius in the last century. So let me ask you this question. What do you notice about how the results are reported? Okay, so what unit have we, what do we have? We've got degrees Celsius. All right, we're used to degrees Fahrenheit here in America, but uh, degrees Celsius is what the rest of the world and especially the scientific world uses. And then how about um, zeros or how many digits are reported? Um, so let me give you an example down here. Um, so do 0 0.6 degrees Celsius, 0 0.60 degrees Celsius, 0 0.600 degrees Celsius, and what if it was 0 0.58759824 degrees Celsius? Do they, all of those numbers, do they con convey the same information? I want you to take a, a second and ponder that. Hopefully, your answer was no, they don't. Um, 0 0.6 is definitely... Um, different than 0 0.600 and 0 0.58759, blah, 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 right? Um, the, the number of digits that are given in a measurement are super important uh, to note, and so that's why they call them significant figures. The number of significant figures that are um, given in a unit of measurement is going to um, is going to uh, basically be a reflection of how precise of a calculation they have made. So when they say the average global temperature has risen by 0 0.6 degrees Celsius, that's only one significant figure. So we can only you know basically have the preciseness to one sig fig. So that's much different than if they could say 0.58759824 to be that precise in um, average global temperature um, would not be realistic. So the number of digits that you see in in uh, you know reported in a measurement is going to be very very important. Um, especially when we're doing calculations with these, because we want to reflect however many significant figures there are in the original measurements. So let's take a look. All right, so scientists always adhere to a standard way of reporting measured quantities. They report, um, you know, the number of significant digits that they report reflects the precision of the measurement, like I'd, like I'd mentioned. So the more digits you have, the more precise the measurement. The fewer digits in a number, then the less precise a measurement. So um, the global temperatures that we saw in the last slide, 0 0.6 versus 0 0.60 versus 0 0.600 versus 0 0.5, blah, 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 blah. Okay, all of those have different numbers of sig figs, and so they're going to reflect different um, amounts of precision. So the 0 0.6 is not very precise, okay, but 0.58759824 is definitely a very precise measurement. So when we're measuring something, um, whether it be the measurement of a pencil or the measurement of the circumference of the earth or something like that, we always report uh, scientific numbers so that every digit is certain except the last. And the last digit is going to be estimated. So if we take a look at this pencil over here in um, you know, this example, we're looking at a centimeter ruler and it only has dashes every centimeter. So there's a dash at one centimeter, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 centimeters. So it's not a super you know, precise um, uh, de measuring device, but we can still measure the length of the pencil. So we know it for sure that the pencil is between six and seven centimeters. We know it is over six, but less than seven. So our uh, reported <clears throat> number must be between six and seven. And so six is 
certain. Okay, so that is definitely certain. And then anything more than that is gonna be estimated, but we can only estimate one digit. So in this case, if we take a look at the ruler and say the pencil is 6.7, 6.8 centimeters, okay, that last digit is estimated. So it doesn't have to obviously be precise. All right, so we could, somebody could say that the pencil is 6.6 .6 centimeters, Another person could say it's 6.7. Another person could say it's 6.8. All of them would be correct um, because that last digit is always estimated. So in this um, number over here, 45.872, you know, whatever measurement that came from, the 4, 5, 8, and 7 are certain. So that means we had, you know, if we're dealing with rulers, that we had um, rulers where you can measure uh, precisely to the hundredth value, okay? Um, however, this two is estimated digit, okay? So um, that's that means that, you know, whatever we're measuring is not exactly on, um, you know, seven point, you know, the, uh, on that seven mark. It's a little bit further, so we can say, you know, seven two. So that part is estimated. So whenever we're looking at a digit, um, every number except the last one is going to be certain, and the last one is always an estimated digit. All right, so um, what you should do is take a look at your papers or up on screen and pause the video and see if you can report the measurements using the correct number of sig figs. So again, go ahead and pause it and uh, maybe even talk with each other, kind of reflect and see, okay, can I report a measurement with the correct number of sig figs. All right, so let's see how you did. So in the first one, um, with uh, this green line here, we're measuring in inches, and we've got a ruler that can measure to a tenth of an inch. So we know for sure that is one, and then we know that you know it goes to that point one, a little bit you know, so it's 1.1, .1. then it's in between the 1.1 .1 and the 1.2. So remember that last digit is always estimated. So we could say 1.15, or if you said 1.16, okay, that would be totally fine. But in here, we're going to uh, report three sig figs. The first two are certain, and that last one is estimated. All right, and then we also always want to make sure that we have our unit. All right, in the next example here with uh, PSI, pounds per square inch pressure reading, we can see that, um, you know, again, we've got uh, it's at least four, okay? We know that it goes past the four mark, and this is in one, two, three, four. So it's point, it's a uh, tenth. So we know that it's 1, 2, th point 3, but then again, that arrow is between the point 3 and the point 4, and it's kind of closer to the point 3. So we can say 4.33, perhaps, all right, PSI, where again, the 4 and the first 3 are certain, and that last one is estimated. All right, so again, this one would also have three sig figs reported. All right, in the, in the last example we ha have here, we've got two rulers, and this is going to help us kind of determine, you know, how many sig figs we can actually report with these two different rulers. Ruler A only measures, um, you know, to the, the ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay, it's got no little marks in between, but ruler B has um, little tenth marks in between. So we can, we can already tell that ruler B is going to be more precise than ruler A. Ruler A is going to have less significant figures than ruler B. And let's take a look. So with ruler A, we know that it's definitely past 4. So we can say 4. All right, It's not up to the 5, but we can't determine um, whether it's 4.8, 4.9. Okay, So that one is our estimated digit. So I'm just going to say 4.9. All right, and uh, unfortunately, this ruler doesn't give units, so we'll just put 4.9. All right, so with ruler A, we can only do two sig figs. But now let's take a look at ruler B. Ruler B, okay, we know it's 4. Point, and let's see, 
It is uh, 4.9, but if you take a look, if you look very, very closely, it's not exactly 4.9. It looks like maybe it's 4.91 or 4.92. Anyways, we can estimate one more digit. And even if it did fall exactly on the line, we could estimate it to be 4.90. So we can see that ruler B is more precise because it has more sig figs that we can read off of it. We have three sig figs for ruler B versus uh, two sig figs for ruler A. All right, so that's how sig figs work when we are measuring um, all kinds of different things. All right, so usually when we're in this class, we're not going to be measuring too much um, stuff. We're going to be given measurements. So we need to determine how many sig figs are a number that we're given. And so there's um, six different rules here for determining the number of significant figures in a number or a measurement that's given. All right, so the first is that all non-zero digits are significant. Okay, so the one, one, basically one digits one through nine are always significant. All right, so the one and the five here in this one are definitely significant. The two ones in here are definitely significant. All right, that doesn't mean that the zeros never are significant or, or counted in the, in the um, number. But um, some zeros count and some zeros don't. So basically, the rest of the rules are going to help us figure out whether the zeros count as significant or whether they don't, all right? Whether they count towards the precision of a measurement or whether they're just placeholders um, for us, okay? So rule number two, interior zeros are significant. So I call these sandwiched zeros. They're in between two non-zero digits. So um, this zero here is in between four and two that counts. This zero here is between the two and the eight. That counts. All right. Um, this zero, 50.1. Okay. That zero is definitely going to count because, you know, if we're looking on a ruler, it is definitely 50. And we know, you know, that um, to that precision and we estimate the point 0.1. So that zero definitely counts. All right. So sandwiched zeros always count. All right. Um, now, number three says trailing zeros that fall after a decimal point are significant as well. So if we have a decimal point, the key is that decimal point, all right? You always, always, always have to look and see whether a number has a decimal point. If it does, the zeros after the decimal point are always going to count. So 5.10, that zero counts as significant. If we had a million zeros after it, they would also count as significant. That means our measurement is super, 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 super precise. All right, so trailing zeros after a decimal point are significant. All right, let's go to this uh, next column. It says trailing zeros that fall before a decimal point, okay, um, and but after a non-zero digit are significant as well. So see this uh, zero here that is before the decimal but after the five, that counts, 50.00, very precise measurement, all right. Um, now leading zeros, four and five can be a little tricky, okay. Um, leading zeros all right, so these are, zero, are zeros that come before any um, non-zero digit, okay, are never significant. They are just placeholders, okay? So these zeros here in this number are placeholders. They're just telling us that this measurement is going to be very, very small, 0. 0. 0.00005, all right? So the ones before any type of non uh non-zero digit are never significant. So in this number, there's only one sig fig, that five. That's the only one that counts. The other ones are placeholders. All right, and then the same thing works with uh, number six. Trailing zeros without a decimal are not significant. So that's why I say it's super important to look and see if the measurement has a decimal. If it has a decimal and there are zeros, you know, after... Um, either the first non-zero digit or after the decimal point itself, then they are significant. But in this case, there is no decimal point that's uh, written. And so 
these zeros here are not significant. Again, they are just placeholder zeros. They're going to tell us how big that measurement is. All right, so it's not just 35, it's 350,000. All right, but the only ones that are significant is the three and the five. That's about as precise as we can get. We don't know if it's 350. 1,000 or if it's, uh, you know, 349,972. All right. Um, all we can say that it's third, it's a three and a five. Okay. 350,000. All right. So these are going to, going to be some six rules that you're going to want to keep in mind for sure when we're doing sig figs and you're always going to want to um, reference this, um, when you're taking a look at sig figs. Okay. So there are some exceptions to um, significant figures. And these exceptions come when we are um, working with exact numbers. All right, and so this is kind of weird, um, but exact numbers have unlimited amount of sig figs. So we really don't count them towards, um, when, we, when we're doing calculations, we don't count them towards figuring out how many sig figs should be in our answer. So exact numbers come from counting exact number of discrete objects. So for example, here, there's one, two, three, four, five pennies. Not 5.0, not 5.000, like we can just say five because those are discrete objects. There's, it's not like a length or a, um, a temperature or a weight or something that could you know be kind of a decimal, all right, or a fraction of something. These are five whole pennies. We say five pennies, done, okay? Now, um, also, defined quantities like those in unit, or I'm sorry, in uh, conversion factors. Okay, those are exact numbers. So um, here's some you know easy conversion factors. There's seven days in one week. All right, so um, we wouldn't say that you know seven and one are one sig fig, and so therefore, if we do any calculations with them, we should just have one sig fig. Um, that is not the case. So anytime we have conversion factors, they're not going to, um, they're not going to help us determine how many sig figs our answer should be. All right. So, um, so we've got exact number of discrete objects. We've got defined quantities like conversion factors. And the third type of exact numbers are numbers that are found in equations used to solve problems. So like here, uh, the radius of a circle is the diameter divided by two. Well, this two here is an exact number. It's, you know, it's not 2.01, no, it's not 2.12, it's just two. All right, and so that is an exact number. And so if we solve this um, equation and um, we've got you know three sig figs for the radius and only two sig figs for the diameter, um, and this you know two is only one sig fig, we're not going to count this two when we're trying to determine how many significant figures our answer should be. Okay, so numbers in equations don't count towards significant figures. All right, so just to review, we got um, anytime you have a exact number of discrete objects, they don't count for towards sig figs. Anytime you have unit conversions, do not count them towards sig figs. And um, anytime you have numbers in an equation that you're solving, those numbers that are given in the equation are not counted towards sig figs. So basically, the only thing is counted towards sig figs is the measurements you either take in the lab or the measurements you're given in a problem. All right, so we've come to the you try it. So um, what you're going to do is pause this video, okay, and um, discuss you know uh, with each other with uh, the people at your group how many sig figs are in each number. And after a couple of minutes, um, you can play the video again and then um, see if you got it right. Okay, so let's see if uh, you got it right. All right, so 0 0.0035. All right, so there's zeros in front of the digit. Those are leading zeros, they do not count. So this is two sig figs. And the next one, 0 0.080. These are, this one's a sandwiched zero, so it definitely counts. And this zero comes after a decimal point. So that counts as well. So this measurement is four significant figures. Okay, it is a very precise measurement. It is 
1.080. And so that, that tells you that it falls kind of right on that 1.08 line, and we can't really, you know, um, see if it goes further or not, so we're going to estimate it that it's at uh, 1.08 and then estimate that to be a zero. All right, and the third, there are no zeros, so this is easy. You always count every single non-zero digit, so this one is also four. All right, here is a um, example of one that is in scientific notation. Let me just fix that from my... Um, import there. All right, so 2.97 times 10 to the fifth. All right, so when we're dealing with scientific notation, this is what happens. We are only actually going to look at the front number, 2.97. We can see there that there's no zeros, so there's three sig figs. And let me tell you, let me explain why we don't count anything else. All right, so 2.9 7 times 10 to the 5th means you just move that decimal over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times, and then that decimal disappears. So if we're looking at this number with no decimal in it, okay, we would not count these zeros anyways. And so we'd have 3 sig figs. So that's why we always just, when we're looking at um, scientific notation, we just look at the front number and say, Okay, this one has three sig figs, so therefore the whole number is three sig figs, right? The other zeros are not going to count. Okay, so the next one says one dozen equals 12. All right, um, this is an example of an exact number, right? This is a um, unit conversion, okay? One dozen equals 12 things. It's a dis basically, actually, it's a discrete um, counting of an object, and it is also a conversion factor. So this is unlimited. Okay, we cannot, you know, precisely say how many sig figs there are. All right, second to the last one is uh, 100.0. All right, look, we've got a decimal. That means that all the zeros are going to count. These zeros are behind, um, these zeros here are behind the first non-zero digit, and this zero is going to count because there's a decimal there. So this one has four. However, it's different than this one because look, this one does not have a decimal, 100,000 without a decimal. So this is not a very precise number. Um, whatever measurement could have been, you know, 999,998, okay, or it could be, um, you know, 100,001. We're not sure. Okay, the ruler doesn't go that specific. So all we know is that it's 100,000. Um, so these zeros are not going to count. A, there's no decimal, and B, they're just placeholders. They're telling us, yes, it's a big measurement, but it's not a very precise measurement. So in this case, there's only one sig fig. All right, so hopefully you got all of these right. If you didn't, that means you need to come um, to my, you know, tutoring office hours, either before school or after school, um, to get help because from now on, all the, um, answers that you give me in lab reports, on quizzes, on tests need to be in sig figs. All right. So let's take a look at significant figures in calculations. So this is basically kind of, uh, a lot of the stuff that you're going to be doing this semester in chemistry is um, anytime you do a calculation, your answer needs to reflect the number of sig figs, okay, that tell us, you know, how precise the measurements are, okay? So when we use measured quantities in calculations, you have, the results of the calculation have to reflect the precision of the measurements. We cannot lose or gain precision. That means we cannot lose or gain any amount of significant figures while doing math. All right, so let's take a look. There's two different sets of rules, one for multiplication and division, one for adding and subtracting. So we're going to start with multiplication and division. Anytime you're multiplying or dividing measured quantities, your answer should have the same number of sig figs as your measurement with the fewest sig figs. All right, so let's take a look. 
Here's the first one. In our measured quantities, we've got 5.02. That's three sig figs. Sandwich zeros count. We're going to multiply it that. It's like, for example, say we're taking the volume. So, you know, length times width times height. So we've got three sig figs for the length. This one is one, two, three, four, five sig figs for the width. Okay. And then here is only a what? Look, this zero in front doesn't count. That's a leading zero. But this zero behind does count because of that decimal. So we've got one, two sig figs here for the height. So when we multiply all these together, we're going to get a number like this, but we can't say that the answer is going to be that precise. We cannot, we cannot say that to that precision. We can only count um, as you know the preciseness as the uh, least precise measurement. So we've got three sig figs, five sig figs, and two sig figs. Our answer can only have the fewest number of sig figs that we start with, and so that's two. So what we have to do is round this number to only two sig figs. So we're going to keep the four and the five. We're going to look next door. Okay. If next door, if it's um, five or more, you up the score. Four or less, let it rest. All right. So that's a zero. So that's less than four. So we're going to, you know, let this five rest. It's not going to bump up to a six. So our answer then is 45. Okay. Because we can only have two sig figs in our measurement. Because our least precise measurement was the height at only um, two sig figs, 0 0.10. Okay. All right, so um, that's multiplying. Let's take a look at a division one here. Okay, we're dividing. Um, say this is a density, mass divided by volume. All right, so um, say we've got a mass of uh, 5.892. There's no zero, so that's easy. That's four sig figs. They all count. And then we're going to divide it by the volume, which is 6.10. We do have a zero here. It is a trailing zero, okay, behind a decimal, so that does count. So this is three. Now, if you plug that into your calculator, you're going to get this giant, you know, lots of digit number, okay? Um, but we cannot just write that number and then be done with it because our answer cannot have more sig figs than what we actually measured. All right, so we've got four sig figs for the mass and three sig figs for the volume. That means our answer can only have three sig figs. It can only have the amount as the least of um, sig figs that we've measured. So that means that we're going to have to round this number. Okay, so we're going to keep, we're going to do one, two, three. Those three digits must stay. All right, and then we're going to look next door again to this 9 to see if the 5 stays a 5 or if it bounces up to a 6. And remember, 5 or more up the score. So 9 is more than 5. So we up the score and we say 0.966 instead of 0.965. All right, so now we've got three sig figs um, to match our fewest number of sig figs in our measurements. Okay, again, if this doesn't make sense, you need to come to my before or after school office hours and get tutoring on this, get clarification. All right, here's our last slide that has to deal with significant figures. And this is with adding and subtracting. So we, um, we use a slightly different rule for adding and subtracting. Answers should have the same number of decimal places as the quantity with the fewest decimal places. So in this case, we're not looking at total number of sig figs. We're looking at how many digits are behind the decimal point because that's going to tell us you know, how precise a measurement is. All right, so um, if we're adding up three measurements like this first, okay, we're going to basically line up the decimal points. Okay, and we're going to um, you know figure out which one has the least number of decimal points. Well, this first digit here has the least number of decimal places. It only has two digits after the decimal place. Each of the others have three digits after the decimal place. Well, our answer cannot have three digits after the decimal place if one of our measurements can only measure two digits after the decimal place. So when we add them together, we're going to get... Um, this number, 9.214, but we can't keep it like that because, like we said, we have to use the measurement 
with the fewest decimal places because that's our least precise measurement. And an answer cannot be more precise than our least precise measurement. So we need to round this to only having two decimal places. So we're going to keep the 9, the 2, and the 1. And then again, we're going to look next door to see if um, we're going to keep it a 1 or if we're going to, it's going to bump up to a 2. All right, so 5 or more up the score, 4 or less, let it rest. Well, this is a 4, so we're going to let that 1 rest as just a 1. Okay. All right, so it um, works the exact same way in subtraction. So here we've got an example where there's a measurement with just one decimal place and there's another measurement with three decimal places. Well, guess what? The fewest precision is the one we use. All right, so um, we're going to use the 4.8 as our, um, you know, that uh, as our uh, figuring out how many decimal places our answer should have. So um, we should, when we calculate this, we're going to get 0.835, um, okay? However, right, we can't leave it like that because our um, answer sh needs to have the fewest number of decimal places that we started with. And so um, one decimal place, okay, is our fewest. So that means we have to... Um, we have to round this to just one decimal place. So we're going to keep the 8. We're going to look next door. 4 or less, let it rest. So it's just going to be 0.8. And that's all. Okay, even if we had a bazillion numbers that our calculator tells us, okay, our measurements tell us we can only have one decimal place. Okay, so please keep in mind um, the difference between adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing. Luckily, most of the calculations that we're going to do this semester deal with multiplying and dividing, uh, but there are going to be some cases where you're going to do adding and subtracting, and then there are some cases where you're going to do both, like this says here. So for calculations involving multiple steps where we're, you know, adding and subtracting or multiplying and dividing, or if we, you know, multiply um, one number and then have to divide it by another number, you only round the final answer. You do not round in between. Okay, if we round in between every time, we're going to lose um, the precision every time. Okay, it's going to be a little off every time we do a calculation. And then our answer in the end is not going to be as precise as what um, we started with. All right, so for multi step problems, you only round the final answer. Um, so you're going to keep that in mind. All right, so now that we've talked about how to um, figure out the number of sig figs in a calculation, let's talk about the types of problem solving that you'll have to do here in chemistry. So basically, every single type of problem that you're going to have to sol solve is either one of two kinds. It's either unit conversion, switching from one unit to another, or it is just use like plug and chug into a specific equation. Okay, so using a specific equation to isolate the variable to solve. All right, so basically it's unit conversions or it's simple algebra. All right, every single one of them. So you have to kind of put that f mindset, you know, on as, okay, what type is this? Is do, Am I going to plug it into an equation or am I going to be, um, you know, just basically switching out units and using unit conversions? So let's take a look at the unit conversions. Converting between units always um, include units in the calculation, okay? Every single time. Don't be lazy. If you're lazy, you're not going to get it right, all right? Um, so you have to always make sure that you put your units when you are writing down the numbers on your paper so that you can see that it's going to cancel, all right? So you can multiply and divide and cancel units like any other algebraic quantity. So here is a couple examples. All right, we could say 17.6x times uh, 2.54z over 1x. Well, the x's are going to cancel, right? All right, that's just that's algebra. Top and bottom cancel when you're multiplying. And so you're just going to end up with, you know, 17.6 times 2.54 which is 44.7, taking into account sig figs, and you're going to have z as your unit. Okay, It works the same way if instead of x and z, we're going to put inches and centimeters. 
So say we start out with 17.6 inches and we need to figure out how many centimeters that is. Well, we can use the conversion factor of 2.54 centimeters is equal to one inch. All right, so the inches we're gonna put on the bottom so they cancel. And then 2.54 centimeters goes on top. So again, when we multiply, we get 44.7 centimeters because that's our remaining unit. All right, so it's all about just um, canceling top and bottom um, units. All right, so <clears throat> when we're doing these calculations, we're always going to have um, you know one of these top and bottom type things where we've got um, a number and some unit on top and then a number and the canceling unit on the bottom here, so like centimeters and inches. That is what we call a conversion factor. It's two quantities that are known to be equivalent. So one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. Okay, that's a relationship there we call a conversion factor. And so anytime you have to switch from one unit to another, you have to figure out what is the equivalency between those two units. All right, so, um, and we also have to remember that these conversion factors, um, they don't take into account, they don't um, reflect in the answer for how many sig figs. So in fact, um, this is three sig figs in the answer because this front number that we started with is three sig figs. All right, so we have to remember that um, conversion factors don't count in the number of sig figs that we're gonna report in our answer. All right, so basically, whenever we're converting units, we're gonna have information that we're given, all right, then we either are gonna be given a conversion factor or have to remember or look up or think about a conversion factor to get the information that we're looking for, the information sought. So we're gonna have a given unit, we're gonna have a desired unit, and we need to, our final answer to be in the desired unit. So in order to get rid of that given unit, we have to cancel it. So our conversion factor, has to have the given unit on the bottom so that it can cancel with the given unit that we're given. All right, um, the desired unit always goes on top. All right, so you can construct conversion factors from any two quantities that are known to be equal. All right, anything. All right, you just have to make sure that those two numbers are actually equal. Um, like seven days in one week, that's a conversion factor. Those two are definitely equal. Right, um, 365 days in one year, those are equal. All right, you can use those as conversion factors. All right, so in solving problems, always check if the final units are correct and consider whether it makes sense or not. All right, meaning that um, you know if you start with a decimal and you're dividing by, um, you know, two, right, you should have a smaller decimal answer than what you started with. If you end up with uh, you know, a big number in the end, that doesn't make sense, okay? So use your number sense for sure. All right, so when you're first starting out doing these things, um, we've got some general problem solving strategies um, that to keep in mind. So um, solving problem solving strategy always requires identifying what you're given and identifying what you need to find. All right, then you have to think, yes, use your head to think on how you're going to get from the given point to the end point, okay? And so we've got kind of a four-step procedure that you can um, think about using. So sort the information, figure out what's given versus what you need to find. Number two, strategize, figure out what steps in relationships, what conversion factors maybe might be involved, okay, or maybe what equations might be involved, to get from A to B, then solve, carry out your steps that you figured out, solve it, and then the fourth one is always overlooked by you, okay, but is one of the most important. Check, does your answer make sense? Are your units correct? Do you have the correct number of sig figs? All of those things, if you don't check, you're going to uh, be deducted points on quizzes, on tests, okay, on lab reports. Everything that is worth a grade in this class, if you don't check to make sure your answer makes sense, if you don't check to make sure you wrote down the unit, and if you don't check to make sure you have the correct number of sig figs, you will get points deducted, all right? So you will probably not get the grade that you hoped for, all right? Even if you think you quote unquote know how to do it, that's not gonna be the case, all right? So make sure you check. 
All right, so let's go through an example of uh, unit conversions. Here we have an example that says a recipe for making creamy pasta sauce calls for 0.75 liters of cream. Hmm. Your measuring cup measures only in cups, right? So we must be uh, here in America looking at a European uh, recipe for creamy pasta sauce. All right, so we got to figure out how many cups of cream we should use. Well... We know, um, and we're given, you know, four cups equals one quart. So we've got to think about this. First, we're given 0.75 liters. We need to find how many cups. So if we know how many liters are in a quart and how many quarts are in a cup, we can figure this out, right? So if we can look up how many liters are in a quart, okay, so 1.057 quarts is equal to one liter. That's one conversion factor we're going to use. And then we know that four cups is equal to one quart. We can put this in our little, you know, unit conversion setup and figure out how many cups to use. All right, so we're going to start out, always start out with what we're given. Always, always, always start out with what you're given, 0.75 liters. All right, so um, first we're going to go to quarts because we don't have a conversion factor for liters to cups. Okay, so we're going to go from liters to quarts. Uh, 1.057 quarts is equal to one liter. So the liter goes on the bottom so that we can cancel it. Quarts go on top because that's our, our new unit. Now we don't stop there because the question doesn't ask for quarts. It asks for cups. So we're going to then... Just continue, and we're going to use the other conversion factor that we have, which is four cups is one quart. And again, we're going to put quarts on the bottom because we need it to cancel. All right, and we need to have cups in the end. So you see how all of the units cancel, and at the end, we're, we all, all we have is cups left over, and that is exactly what we are asked for in our question. All right, so if we do the math, we end up with 3.171 on our calculators, all right? Um, but that is not the correct number of sig figs, okay? Remember, whenever you're doing unit conversions, the conversion factors do not count for sig figs. So that means you have to look at what you're given in the first place. So 0 0.75. The zero is a leading zero. It becomes before any non-zero digits. And so that doesn't count. So we've got two sig figs here, seven and five. And so that means we have to round this number to two sig figs. So we're going to keep the three and we're going to keep the one. We're going to look next door, five or more up the score. Woohoo, seven is more than five. So that means we're going to bump one up to two. And our answer is going to be 3.2 cups. Okay, and so let's check. Is it the right unit? Yes, we're in cups. Does the number seem reasonable? Why? Yes. Okay, um, you know, four times one is four, and then three-fourths of four is about three. So that seems about right. Is the correct number of sig figs? Absolutely. We started with two. We need to have two in our, our um, answer. All right, so everything adds up and we can move on. All right, we've come to the end of the lecture, the last slide. In fact, um, this is a you try it, so you should actually have, um, you should pause it right now and figure out um, what this is by yourself. But do look at the hint first. When converting quantities um, with units raised to a power, you must raise the fa conversion factors to that power, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. But try and see if you can figure this out on your own. All right, how many f cubic inches are there in 3.25 cubic yards? Okay, so that is um, yards to the third power. All right, and I would actually do yourself a favor and like highlight this page or something. There is a test question with factors raised to a power. Okay, so you're going to find this type of question on the exam. It's not this exact same one, but it's definitely going to be found on the exam. So make sure you understand how to do it because a lot of people in the past have um, scored uh, very low on this test question, which uh, lowered their, their grade in the class. All right. How many cubic inches are there in 3.25 cubic yards? All right. So again, 
When converting quantities with units raised to a power, you must raise the conversion factor to that power. So, all right, what we're given. We're always, we always look at the question to figure out what we're given. We're given 3.25 cubic yards. All right, and we got to get to inches. So that means we have to go from yards to feet and feet to inches. Okay, so in order to do that, we need a conversion factor between cubic yards and cubic feet. Okay, and this is it right here. All right, so um, in one cubic yard, there's 27 cubic feet. That comes from the fact that, remember, one yard, regular yard, is three feet. But since we have cubes everywhere, we have to cube our numbers too. So one cubed, well, that's just still, it still stays one. Three cubed is 27. So that's how we get 27 cubic yards to one, I'm sorry, 27 cubic feet to one cubic yard. Okay. So that's going to get us to cubic, from cubic yards to cubic feet. But now that we have to go to cubic feet to cubic inches. And so we're going to do the same thing. Well, we know that one foot, one foot is equal to 12 inches, right? That's regular inches, not cubic inches. So to, to figure out how much is in a cubic foot, we have to cube our numbers. So again, one cubed is one. 12 to the third power is 1728, 1728. So that's how we get that number. All right, we have to rate, we have to multiply our numbers by whatever um, you know, factor we have in our in our units. So if it's cubed, you got to cube it. If it's squared, you got to square it. Okay. So please keep that in mind, especially on the exam. All right. So then we just solve. Start with what we're given. 3.25 yards, um, cubic yards. We're going to use our first conversion factor to get it to uh, cubic feet. And then we'll use our second conversion factor to get it to cubic inches. And we can see that the cubic yards are going to cancel. The cubic feet are going to cancel the way that we've set this up. And we're going to have cubic inches in the end, which is fabulous. All right. So when we plug this, these numbers into our, our calculator, we're going to end up with 151632. All right. But we always got to keep in mind sig figs. All right. Well, again, we don't ever use conversion factors in sig figs. So we have to look at our original um, number that we're given. Here, there's no zero. So it makes it easy. We've got three sig figs here. So that means our answer needs to have three sig figs. So basically what that means is we're going to keep the first three numbers and then turn the rest of them to zero. But before we do that, we look to, we look to the neighbor. Five or more, up the score, four or less, let it rest. Well, this is a six, so that means we're going to up the one to a two. So our final answer is going to be 152,000, and check it out, cubic inches. Okay, I should say cubic inches there. All right. Um, does it seem reasonable? Heck yes. If one cubic foot is equal to 1,728 cubic inches and we've got three and a half cubic or three and a quarter cubic yards, it's going to be a big number. Okay. If we ended up with a decimal, that would not make any sense. All right. So we know it's going to be a big number. So that makes sense. Do we have our unit? Well, yes. Did we do sig figs? Yes. All of those things we need to remember to check. All right. So now that we have reviewed sig figs and unit conversions, you guys can um, go on and do um, your practice problems for this in your lab manual.